You know, when you have a, a special moment where um, the love of God connects you and there's a song playing, it's like your brain takes a snapshot of that moment. Just like if there's danger, your brain takes a snapshot. Okay, that sound means danger. But, you know, you're driving, some song kicks on from the 70s, and you're like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, or it reminds you of some kind of moment, some kind of thing where you were touched by goodness or beauty or love. And I got to tell you, I, I have trouble watching that video while singing that song because you know what it reminds me of? Not only are we praying for the mayor and the sheriff and the chief and the district attorney who are pictured there, but it reminds me of this Sunday when Fox News showed up at our church. <laughs> and uh, asked if they could just come in and film some footage. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. And, and uh, we sang that song. And when it was done, Paula finished playing and went to the back and the reporter was crying. Oh. Paula hugged her and, and, and the reporter said, that was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. She hadn't experienced anything like it. And uh, so, now that's what that song means to me. It's uh, one of those moments when God used us to bless the heart of um, not only the reporter, but that was their lead story, and they only played that song while they gave their news story. So um, we're not looking fam for fame, we're looking to make Jesus famous. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's awesome when uh, he invites us along for the ride. I keep looking in my bulletin for my sermon. It's not printed there. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know. You guys must have gotten the memo because today I'm talking about why do I need to go to church? <laughs> so I don't know how many of you showed up and said, oh, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. See you again in six weeks, Pastor. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we look to your word today, we invite you to make it alive and active in our hearts. Because, Lord, we're not here for a religious exercise. We're not here just to gain knowledge. We're not here to build up our willpower so we can be good people. Lord, we're here today to connect to you because when we are connected to you, life is amazing. Apart from you, we really can do nothing. It's not about reward and punishment. It's about plugging into the source of life. And Lord, you are the source of life. And so, Lord, we invite you to interact with our, our hearts and souls today. To open the eyes of our heart that we may see you more clearly. Open our ears to hear your voice speaking your words of love to us yet again. And Lord, open our hearts that we would believe you and trust you at your word and act upon it. Bless us, Lord, because we just want more of you today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You know, when we first started Crosstown, we went door to door getting people's opinions. And uh, there was a steering committee from our denomination to give me direction on, on what to do because it was all new to me. And one of the questions they said to ask, ask people, why do you think most people don't go to church? And they said, what they'll tell you is why they don't go to church. <laughs> right? But you're... <laughs> Putting it in a way that's safe for them. Well, I think those people <laughs> probably don't go to church because da da da, you know, all kinds of stuff. But um, it's something I hear from people all the time, and if you've been coming since September, you're used to hearing this. But I, I hear people say, "Well, I don't have to go to church to be a good person." Who told you you have to be a good person? And who told you the, the standard or the scale of uh, what um, makes you good? There, there's a reason, and we're going through from the beginning of September all the way through Easter of answering these questions. Why do I need to? Or why should I? Because when you forget why you do stuff... Then you start to slack off, and then there's a brutal reminder. You know, why do you lock your front door at night? <laughs> Nothing will probably happen, but something possibly will happen. Yeah. And uh, you don't want that possibility to happen. 
And, and if you have it in your head that God rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior, you don't know the scriptures. And you don't know the word of God. What Jesus is telling us about, what he's instructing us in, is not about being a good person so God gives you bonus chips and then you cash them in for prizes every now and then. Seriously, that's what the world thinks. Right. <laughs> we come to connect and it's like, I mean, if, if you know, you're in love and, and, uh, and you say, well, I don't have to go visit my girlfriend to be a good person. It's like... What are you talking about? <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, you're going to lose her, right? Right. Yeah, no, it, it, it's something totally different. So this whole month is about connecting with Jesus. And sometimes people don't make the connection. I mean, we talked about the need to pray, the need to be reading the Bible, not just because of the initial things about that, but because those are ways you connect to Jesus. I mean, if some guy told me, oh, I don't have to talk to my wife to be a good husband, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> You're stupid. Go talk to your wife. Yeah, yeah. Church is where you have the opportunity to be empowered and equipped to experience what Jesus said is the greatest commandment. If you remember, when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I hear people, well, I don't have to go to church. I believe you can worship God in your own home in your own way. It's like, well, yeah, but you're not. <laughs> because you're missing part B of the great commandment, right? Right? It's like, well, I love God. It's just everybody else are a bunch of idiots. That's like saying, I love you, but your children are idiots. How long is that friendship going to last, right? Right? No, and yet people do it to God all the time. Mm -hmm. Because really, uh, actually, after a while, you're like, you love your children? You're an idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Church is the, also the best way to express your love and gratitude toward God. Yeah, you don't have to if you don't actually have any love and gratitude toward God. Then you don't feel compelled to do it. It's not like, you know, when, when your mom said to apologize to your sister. You don't show up, thank you, Jesus, for the flowers and the bird. We have people here who can't sit still when they worship because of the horrific nightmare that Jesus delivered them out of and their gratitude wells up in them. I've shared before about a young woman who visited. She sat right here on Sunday morning, didn't know anybody here, and I said, oh, how did you find us? She goes, well, my mom lives in the neighborhood, and I'm visiting her, and I used to be a prostitute, and the Lord set me free from that slavery, and I have to worship him somewhere every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Not because Jesus told him to, but because the love of God compels her. Mm -hmm. It's the best place to express your love and gratitude toward God. Especially since Jesus actually said, where two or more are gathered, I am there with you. And sometimes you'll have an interaction with somebody, and when you walk away, you don't think, oh, isn't that cool how that worked out? You walk away saying, that was amazing. God was present with us. And you have those special times. Jesus didn't say, when... It's like I'm there with you when two or more are gathered. No, he said, I am with you when two or more are gathered. There's a whole different dynamic. Yeah, we read our Bible, we pray off by ourselves alone, and we gather together to pray and study God's word and, and interact in ways that Scripture tells us to because there is a whole other dynamic when we are gathered. So... In the book of Acts, which we're studying on Wednesday, this last Wednesday, we talked about in, in chapter 11 how it was really cool what was going on in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, they got as far as Jerusalem and nobody wanted to leave. So God had to give Saul of Tarsus a big stick and chase them all out of town. And so they started to spread out. And whenever God is teaching you and leading you, 
a lot, right about the time you think, okay, I finally got it, I, I know what I'm doing now, God blows your mind by opening an entirely new door. And for the Jewish Christians, they still had it in their mind that this was for the Jews, because they were God's people. And it, it wasn't that they were entrenched racists, it just didn't dawn on them that God would work beyond their borders. So in Acts chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 19 through 30, and it says this. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word of God only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Sar Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They, this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. <coughs> so they spread out, and Antioch had a reputation as a city, spiritually, of anything goes. And so when they heard, oh, there's believers gathering and worshiping Jesus in Antioch, the, 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 the saints in Jerusalem like, Antioch, oh man. Barnabas, you better go check and see what they're doing. Kind of like if, you know, hey, revival broke out in Berkeley. People are like, Berkeley? Oh, no. What does that look like? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so Barnabas went down, and what they found was the Holy Spirit's powerful enough to take care of business. So it wasn't some strange conglomeration of a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. No, they were a very diverse mix of people worshiping Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and eager to learn from the scriptures. Nothing in the world had happened like that before. And it was amazing, and they celebrated it, but it blew their minds because nothing like that had happened before. So they sent some leaders from Jerusalem to check it out. People from Jerusalem checked it out and said, whoa, this is amazing. Matter of fact, Barnabas said, I think I'm going to stay here for a year and <laughs> just soak it up for a while, right? And then as, as God is moving, uh, somebody with the gift of prophecy stood up and said, the Holy Spirit's telling me a famine is going to break out over the Roman world. And they're like, we are so grateful for Jerusalem being ground zero for the gospel. Let's start saving and, and collect money to help the saints during the famine. And so they did. So again, there's this back and forth relationship. It's not like Americans when they say, so which one's right? right. Well, apparently not you, because you have a wrong worldview, <laughs> right? No, it, it's like the joy is spreading. And there's empowerment and joy in our connectedness. Imagine if you have a really slow computer, which I did, it's like you're in a hurry and your car only goes five miles an hour. <laughs> and they tell you your computer needs more memory. It's like, so how do I do that? Well, then you talk to somebody like, you know, people under 30, and they, and they uh, 
Okay, Grace. Uh, people under 31. And, <laughs> and uh, they, um, they will tell you, well, you can buy memory cards, and you can open your computer and um, either add those memory cards or take out the old ones that have a low capacity and put in the new ones, and it makes more connections that gives you more memory. Or maybe your computer's just slow because it's got a really slow processor. It's like, my uncle bought this for me in the 80s. I love this processor. <laughs> yeah, your phone has more power than that. Come on. So you, you can take it out, put in the new processing, and um, it will increase your computer's memory. It will increase your computer's processing and ab ability, it can do more, it can run faster, it can run smoother because of what you've added to it. So suppose you have a friend who offers to install it because apparently it's simple. <laughs> if you know what you're doing. But you're afraid, I don't know, if you take the cover off, that might breach the Holy of Holies and God will be angry or something, I don't know. But uh, you should, I don't know if you should open it up and mess with it. You're not completely sure what these chips will do, and you're afraid, will, I, uh, will it crash my hard drive? Will I lose everything I had? And what if it slows my computer down even more? What if it uses more memory to access the new parts, and so I don't have room for any new documents? And meanwhile, the computer geeks are like, ah, you poor lost soul. <laughs> right? Well, there's a lot of people that think that way about other people. They look at people they don't know, and they think, if I were to get around them and get to know them, I will probably suffer loss. That's what the world tells you. Matter of fact, people who are really entrenched in the world's view, when they meet you, they're offended like, you're breathing air that should be mine. There are people that literally think that about you and me. And yet in the kingdom of God, God says, I want to increase your capacity to love by adding to it. Uh, those of you who have more than one kid, <laughs> after the first child, you're like, oh, I just love him with all my heart. Oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine this. And it's like, you having a second child? I don't know, I hate to take away from the love of that child. Like, like you know, God says, sorry, you only get a quart. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Divided by eight kids, well, you barely even recognize them. No, no, it, it's amazing how God just uses that new person to increase your capacity yes. to love and to bless you. Yep. I remember the Victims of Violent Crime Support Group, one time a family of four kids came, their mom had been murdered, they're all adults, and as each one introduced themselves, and I'm mom's favorite, yeah. <laughs> and I'm so-and-so, and I'm mom's favorite. And mom used to pull them aside and whisper to them, you know you're my favorite, right? She'd say that to all of them. And although they knew, yeah, mom's feeding it to everybody, they just, they cherished that and loved that. You need to understand, we were created for connection. To love God and love people. God said everything else is secondary to that. To loving God and loving people. Now the world gets crazy ideas of what it means to love. Some people think, oh, I love you by trying to give you the most amazing experience on your senses. Therefore, out of love for you, I'm going to give you meth. I'll sneak it in your drink so you can experience the amazing thing I feel. And they call that love and they destroy your life. Right. Yeah, that's uh, some child molesters, that's their motivation. Uh, oh, I love this child, therefore I do this to them. And, and so, yeah, the world has a very twisted view, which is why you really need to be connected to God's Word. But you were created for connection, to love people and to love God. It's not a command for you to obey. It's a blessing for you to enjoy. It's what we were created for. It's like, I, I fix you a bowl of ice cream. Oh, do I have to? No, you don't have to, you get to. When we love, when we love people, we are moving closer together to them. That's what love does. When, when you, I remember my older brother on the phone hours with his girlfriend, and I'm thinking, God, strike me dead if I ever go there. You know? uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 you know. <laughs> Love wants to connect. 
Love wants to grow closer. A matter of fact, if you read the old King James and, and it, you know, like, like in Genesis, where it says basically that Adam had sex with his wife Eve, the, the, the Hebrew word actually says, and Adam knew his wife Eve. It, it was that closeness, that, that connection. When, when you see somebody you think is fascinating and you want to get to know them, you don't go home and stalk them on Facebook. You walk up and introduce yourself and you start asking questions about who they are. And then they might start asking questions about who you are. And when you walk your, away, you're like, wow, that was great because you connected heart to heart. I've had people who have impacted my entire life because one evening's conversation. I have no idea where they are or what they're doing. Matter of fact, I don't come to think of it, I never even heard their last name. But because of the heart-to-heart -heart conversation we had, we impacted each other. You see, when we love, we are moving closer together, making stronger connections. Now, when we feel shame or fear, we withdraw, we step back, we create disconnect. It, that's never good. You ever hear of a married couple and they say, um, yeah, there's a great job opportunity, so my husband's going to go work in Dubai for six months. That is always bad to chase money. Not because, you know, he'll be tempted by some harem in the lobby there or something like that, but no, because you are disconnecting. I tell people all the time, you know, what do you call a plant that's not growing? Dead, <laughs> right? You, you always want to be making these deep connections. And when, out of fear and shame, the, the devil tries to create disconnect. And it distances ourselves. That, that's what sin does. That, that's why God hates sin, because it creates disconnect between you and him and you and everybody else. Well, it's kind of funny how science is always eventually catching up to scripture and brain science now shows us that our interconnectedness with one another impacts the interconnectedness of the different parts of our brain you have different parts of your brain that serve different functions in the back uh, right right at the top of your spine is the most basic things it's it does stuff like tells you to keep breathing and regulates your heartbeat it's the most primal part of your brain to keep you alive. Up front is like the computer processor. You get new information, it's like, oh, well, that looks kind of like that. And it, it's like, it, it sorts things out and makes sense of things. It, that's the part that empowers you to sit down and think through a problem. And then you have other parts of your brain that regulate other different things. And what they found is if, if you are disconnected from others socially, the different parts of your brain suffer disconnect and you literally can't think straight. So what do you think COVID did to our society? That's why it seems like a bunch of people lost their minds, right? Because they were disconnected socially and they literally cannot think straight. They cannot process information in a healthy way like they used to be able to. Our interconnected, interconnectedness socially impacts the interconnectedness of us mentally. And if we are disconnected socially, it makes us disconnected mentally and makes us more fearful and more angry. And what do we do then? We isolate. People aren't safe. We shouldn't be around them. And what does that do? Creates more disconnect, creates more fear, creates more anxiety, makes us more afraid. It's like, I can't go out. I can't trust those people. All they want to do is take from me. They probably want to kill me. Come on. They're your brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. Come to dinner. <laughs> yeah. You never know. One article I read said, when isolated, we become more anxious, fearful, stressed, and angry. And loneliness makes us feel more threatened by social interactions, the very thing we need. So we crawl deeper into isolation, creating a cycle of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Former U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy wrote, over time, 
This vicious cycle may convince us we don't matter to anyone and that we're unworthy of love. Ultimately, socially, socially isolated people are 50% more likely to die prematurely. As if they were having six alcoholic drinks a day or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's what isolation does to you. Harvard researchers in 2020 released a new study documenting that attendance at church dramatically reduces deaths from suicide, drugs, and alcohol. <laughs> Attending services at least once a week cut these so-called deaths by despair by 33% among men and 68% among women compared to those who never attended church. Wow. Perhaps God knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. God designed us for love and connectedness with others. And when fear prevents us from connecting, it creates more fear. It's like being depressed and drinking alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant. It makes you more depressed. That's like, oh, there's a kitchen fire. Let me throw gasoline on it. Yeah. Fear creates disconnect. But 1 John 4.48 says perfect love drives out all fear. Perfect love drives out all fear. This is quite the adventurous church because I know many of you have done things because you signed up for a program and when you got there you're like, I signed up for this. Jesus help me. Here we go. Right? And in you go. And it's like, you know what you did? You disarmed the lie of the devil. Yes. When he said, I don't know if that's safe. And you said, I don't know either, but I'm going. Because I told Jesus and Rosie I'm going. Or I told <laughs> Jesus and Brian that I'm going. Or, or, or something like that. Here we go. And Sometimes I like to share really stupid prayers that people pray. Because it was me. <laughs> but you know, CSI, I'm looking online to see where the latest homicides are. And uh, some of them I'm surprised, some of them like, oh, it's the third one in that place. And if, if fear has started to creep in or discouragement, you start thinking stupid lots like, Lord, can't you let somebody die in a nice, nice neighborhood? You know? <laughs> and, and there was one, one week where three homicides in one area, and, and my prayer becomes, Jesus, we already said we're going to go here. So we're going. Could you please not let any of us get stabbed or shot? That would be nice. And we go, and there's two young men sitting there, and I'm like, ah. Young men in a group, the IQ always goes down. Lord, keep us safe, protect us. And we go there, and they're, they're, they're sitting where their friend was killed, and they're Buddhists. They have candles out, and they have food out. And, and uh, so we just went in, and right away we said, why, we're there. And they stood up, and, and they said, let me go get the deceased sister. She's across the street. And she comes, so we repeat why we're there. And she puts down her stuff and puts her hands out. It was an amazing encounter of new lines of connection that increased our love capacity and the devil tried to use fear to prevent it. Man, we would have missed out because it just led to a whole series of events. Trust is the courage to live with the shortcomings of others believing that the relationship is worth it. Because let's face it, everybody has their quirks, right? right. Everybody does something kind of stupid or quirky, and after a while you just got to laugh at it and keep going, right? Because we all do. It, it's interesting, about 20 years ago, George Barna, who studies trends in America, he said there's a trend coming where we are going to have a new kind of Puritans. But it's unlike anything you've ever seen. Because when you think the Puritans, you think, you know, women in bonnets dressed in black and white in the 1600s who, you know, have no tolerance for imperfection or sin, right? No, now that, that would be the, the far conservative. Now it's the far liberal. They have no tolerance for any imperfection. And not only will they discuss it with you, but they'll say it would be wrong for me to discuss it with you. And so they protest, not because we haven't made progress, but because it's not perfect. 
It's a new form of Puritanism, but it's radically different from the past. Yet God calls us, you know what? Love them anyway. Interact with them anyway. That won't make you a good person. It will make you a blessed person because it's going to increase your capacity to have love for others. I, I, I share with people, it's awful, but you know, some of you who come here, 25 years ago, I would have freaked out if you walked in the door like, uh-oh, it's one of those people. What are they doing here? <laughs> Jesus, don't let them hurt us. And now we hug you at the door and we feel blessed because you're here. And when you walked in, you saw me and said, oh, it's one of those people. Jesus, don't let them hurt me. <laughs> right? Right? We found that the connections that God wants to give us are worth it. He wants to bless us. He wants to upgrade our love capacity. Because you know what happens when you create this love relationship with people radically different from you? Then when you're driving through town and you see people who look like them, you're like, ooh, that could be another friend. <laughs> and and I, I tell you, God has blessed us with interactions that I wouldn't get anywhere else except for you all. And, and I, there, there was, and I know I mentioned some of these a lot, but they have impacted me so much. But one time uh, my son Noah was sick and they're checking him out in the hospital and Paula and I are in the hallway and we start looking around like, okay, Jesus, why are we here? And some woman sits next to me and she starts asking questions and all of a sudden she goes, you're a pastor, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes. And then she's like, Whoa, how did I know that? <laughs> you know? And then like the woman at the well, she feels the need to start talking God talk, you know? And, and she says she'd love to come to a church, but she doesn't own a dress. I thought, wow, the devil fed her a lie to keep her disconnected from the people of God. And Paula says, honey, I lead worship and I'm in jeans half the time. So you are more than welcome to come to our church. God wants to bless you. He wants to upgrade your capacity. And quite frankly, he wants to help you think straight. But if you're afraid, I don't know about those people that may be dangerous. And you know what? It's just safer to isolate here and cut the world off. Then after a while, it's just you and the internet. And things get crazy real fast. Yep. You know, when dementia happens... Each of your brain cells are connected to each other, and, and your brain sends electrical signals through it, much like a computer works, computer memory, and that's how it processes. But where those connections are, you know, if you like, you know, smoke too much weed or, <laughs> or uh, ate too many Twinkies when you were younger or something like that, uh, stuff starts to build up. And, and, you know, crud happens, it builds up in between those neural connections, or they just get fried from meth or something like that, then those connections no longer work. And your brain has to reroute the signal, and, and hopefully there is another route for the signal to go around. And what happens with dementia is all those signals start getting blocked or corroded or shut down, so you can't process your thoughts anymore. It decreases the capacity to process information, and it disintegrates your brain. The parts of your brain are not integrated anymore. They, they, they struggle to connect. And like I said, brain science also tells us that social integration impacts our mental integration. We were created for connection. Unfortunately, you know, you ever looked at somebody and you're like, I, I can't wait till I have Alzheimer's. I won't have a worry or a care in the world. <laughs> yeah. There's people doing that socially. I heard one pastor, he said, the way the world's going, I'm thinking of just buying a bunch of weapons in a cabin deep in the woods and moving my family there. And I'm like, it's really hard to go the ye into all the world and make disciples from a cabin deep in Montana, you know. So your goal is to stay alive till you die. That seems a little futile, right? Because death is going to come one way or the other. We were created for connection. 
to love God and to love people. It's not a command to be obeyed. It's a blessing to be enjoyed. It's what we are created for. When we love others who are very different from us, we're making new relational connections. It drastically impacts your ability to think straight. I like to say, you know, suppose you I don't trust other people. I, I only date people from family reunions. That's going to impact your ability to think straight, especially your children and your grandchildren, right? There's a reason why society discourages that. You make new connections in circles totally different, it supercharges your thinking capacity, your love capacity. Like adding more circuit boards to your computer, it makes it more powerful. The church in Antioch, they ventured out. They reached not just other Jews, but they started speaking to Greek speakers, thinking, hey, maybe if we share with them the gospel, they'll give their lives to Jesus. And they do, and they're like, hey, who would have thought? <laughs> Apparently, Jesus was for more than just Jews, and, and it, it really spread like wildfire. And God was able to move in powerful ways in that church. And nobody could have just done that on their own in isolation. Only in the church context. People are like, do you really have to go to church every week? It's like, I get to go to church every week. That's Are you right, kidding? Right, you know the kind of people that right. come here? You ever sat down and talked to them and heard their stories? It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And that builds that connection. It builds that love between you and others. And then you look at other new people, you're like, I wonder what they got. <laughs> wonder what story is God is working on in them. And if you're like, yeah, I'm not there yet. Hey, you're here, so God's already up to something. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And believe me, the day is approaching. God's intention for you is to be more strongly connected to Him and to others. It's what you were created for. It's not a command to be obeyed. It's a blessing to be enjoyed. Every person we connect to increases our love capacity. Lung? Love capacity. Adding new components to your social computer. You make these connections with conversations. You, you ever met somebody and all they did was talk about, you know, Fox News or MSNBC? Yeah, there's a waste of time, right? <laughs> Because at the end, you know nothing about them. You just got the latest update from Fox News or MSNBC, which you can do on your own time if you chose to waste it. But when you talk to people about who they are, about what God is doing in their life, when you share your heart with them, that is where those connections take place. We make these connections with our conversations. And you might think, but those people are idiots. I don't want to talk to them. You know what? That's just a sign of how blind you are and how fragmented your thinking is. Your logic would lead you to believe that God is the biggest idiot of them all because he loved those people that you despise. There was a uh, chaplain with the police department, Brother Barry Means. Barry Means was um, deep in the heart of African, old African-American community in Stockton. And the first several times I talked to him, I couldn't understand a word he was saying. I mean, very old African-American from the South, and he would say stuff, and I thought, he's saying something, but I have no idea what he's saying. Just, I don't know if it was the Louisiana accent combined with his culture or what. I couldn't understand a word he was saying. And I was just determined to keep listening, and I, I sat down, and I'd ask him a question, he'd give an answer, and all of a sudden, it was like a switch got flipped in me, and I understood every word he said. And he didn't change. I took the time to purposely listen. And you know what I heard? He was a chaplain in the Army in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Oh, my God. Suddenly I realized, oh my gosh, he's old, time is ticking, I have a limited time to unwrap that treasure. I need to set aside as much time as I can to listen to this man. 
and you think that deepened my love for him? Yeah. And here's, here's some young white kid from white parts of Stockton, <laughs> and he wants to know my heart? Jesus, you must be real, right? <laughs> Makes this connection. He's passed away since then. But I can't emphasize enough, he didn't change. I chose to sit and listen to him. Because otherwise, we look at him, oh, it's one of those people, I know what they're like, I'm not going to waste my time. Right. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use, it will measure to you. Which means when you say... I'm not going to talk to those people. They're idiots. Jesus is up there. You just declared you're an idiot. <laughs> but when people are afraid, they tend to surround themselves with what's familiar and what reinforces their fears. We call that an echo chamber. Because they say something and they hear it back. Oh, you're right. It's like, dude, that was your own voice. It's an echo. <laughs> When I was kids, there were three networks. You had three news choices, NBC, ABC, and CBS. That was it. Now, you can go on the internet and pick and choose and hear the craziest stuff, right? You can go to the Flat Earth Society and get their latest scientific evidence that the Earth is flat. There were a couple of guys, they just thought just for fun, they'd create a conspiracy theory. Oh, during bird flu, it killed all the birds in the world, so the government made robot birds to spy on you, and all the birds out there robots. It took off. People believe it. I thought just for fun, I should make a conspiracy theory, but I thought, no, I'll get a cult following, and they'll all show up in my yard. Because if you choose to only listen to the secret insider knowledge you found, and write everybody else off as an idiot, you're the idiot. You're saying, I, I shouldn't connect to that person. They're different. They're not safe. They're stupid. No, they're a gift from God that he wishes you would connect with. Um, there's a lawyer who has written some Christian books, an amazingly adventurous guy named Bob Goff. Whenever he hears about something crazy, he goes there and takes him to lunch. And so he moved into a home in Southern California and he saw a mosque down the street. And he thought, ooh, a mosque. I need to take the imam out to lunch. So they went out to lunch and they sit down and I'm sure the imam is like, what's this Christian white lawyer wanted to talk to me about, you know? And he said, so, what's been your impression of Christians? And the imam thought about it. And he said, on September 11, 2001, my people were terrified and they fled to the mosque. And when we got there, mm -hmm. there was a group of Christians circled around the mosque, holding hands, singing praise music. Mm -hmm. And we knew we were safe. Mm -hmm. wow. That's what I think of Christians. Mm -hmm. You can't write people off. Every now and then you meet somebody and they're totally whacked and you're like, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But often you will find, oh, there's good reason for the way they are. And while you're talking to them, they may be thinking, I can't believe this person wants to get to know me. Maybe they're not all out to get me. You know what? If you talk to somebody and all they do is spew their political views or if you're one of those people... It can be really draining to just sit and listen to them and regurgitate their political views. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Our conversations are when we are sharing our heart, sharing about the beauty and the brokenness in our lives. Those are the real conversations. Everything else is just noise. I've, I share this a lot here, but Dr. Dan Allender says, mm -hmm. you're not having real conversation until you engage the heart. And you engage the heart when you express your beauty or brokenness, which are usually intertwined. Yeah. And the ultimate example of that is Christ on the cross. Amen. This is our source of joy. Connection with God and connection with others. And when I say joy, I mean joy like hanging out with your best friend. 
Sin disrupts those connections. Idolatry is when we think we'll find that same love and joy through stuff. Hmm. Non-loving, non-living things. Believing we can have that same joy that God intended without having to trust God or his children. It's a cheap, false substitute based on lies of the devil who only came to steal, kill, and destroy. We don't tolerate sin because it disrupts, disconnects, isolates, and instills fear and hate. It's not because we're super righteous and you're wrong. It's because we love you and we want to stop what's killing you. We make connections when we share our hearts in real conversations about our beauty and brokenness. That could be the bridge that brings people out of their darkness into this marvelous light. We've had a lot of people who come here because they discovered somebody actually cares about them in the midst of their dark place. And talking to them about their beauty and brokenness is the bridge that helps them get back into their right mind so they can think straight. Colossians 1, 12-14 says, We are giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter puts it this way, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see the theme there? Amen. Sin, fear, and hate cause disconnect, yes. darkness, disintegration, both internal and external. It's why God opposes sin. That's why the demonic is hell-bent on disrupting our love relationships with God and with people. And that is why, 1 John says, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Why do people say they don't go to church? Oh, it's a waste of a perfectly good day off. Really? I'm not ready for God's presence. I haven't been right. Well, go there. He'll make it right. Amen. I'm already good enough. Oh. <laughs> Maybe they're angry at God for something that happened to them. Well, let's go ask. Let's talk to him about it. Let's connect. Well, I might get COVID. It's like, you're still there? That's an irrational fear that's demonically inspired. Mm -hmm. Well, my old church kind of went bad, and I'm too nervous to explore a new one. Come on, I'll hold your hand. I'll sit next to you. It'll be okay. Well, I got badly burned at another church. Okay, now you know what's wrong. Why don't you come see what's right? Mm -hmm. Why should you go to church? To connect with the God who loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. Amen. That's right. And with the people that he wants to bless you with. Amen. So that you can think straight and be blessed with his joy and his presence all the days of your life, no matter what in our crazy world is going on. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you that all your commands are for, for our good. Not so we'll be sticky, sweet, and righteous, but so we'll be connected to you, the source of life. And Lord, I thank you that while the world says that different kind of people are unsafe and we need to build barriers, you, O oh God, keep making amazing connections that increase our capacity to love and to think straight. Lord, I thank you that your love drives out all fear. Lord, I thank you that in your light there is no darkness at all. And Lord, when we quote that verse, the perfect love drives out all fear, you're not telling us to try really hard to be perfect in love. You're telling us to invite your perfect love into us and then watch you go and marvel at where you take us, the connections you make for us, so that our lives are radically altered in a good way for all eternity. Lord, don't let fear disrupt us. Don't let fear make us believe isolation is the best thing. The ultimate isolation is hell. That's not a good goal to have. But Lord, you want to connect us. You want to bless us. You want to 
fill us with your joy and your peace. And so, Lord, we ask that you would mend some of these bridges so we can think straight. Lord, I ask that you would empower and equip us to love people very different from ourselves just so we can sit down and say, so why are you angry all the time? Tell me about your childhood. Wow, where are you from? And just to listen to their heart, not to change them, but to listen long enough that you can change us. Lord, thank you that we live in the United States and we're still able to go to church without threat of death. Lord, there's dozens of countries around the world where they can't. Bless them, Lord. Keep them safe as they worship together in secret. And Lord, don't let us take lightly the gift that you have given us during this time. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your relentless love, your relentless pursuing us to create a deeper connection with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.